Good morning, everyone. It's very, very exciting to be here. And thanks for that introduction, Doreen. Um, I, I was uh, not so excited to realize that I have two impossible tasks to start the conference. Um, the first is I noted I'm billed as moderator for a session involving Lord Leicester. Um, anybody who knows Anthony will know you cannot moderate him, so I'm going to give up on that now. Um, the, the second task is to introduce him, and I was thinking about that and uh, chatting to Doreen last night uh, electronically, as one does. Uh, and it is, of course, impossible to introduce someone who needs no introduction, but I'm going to do, uh, to do so anyway. Um, I met Anthony in 1987, um, some little time ago. At that time, he was representing Times newspapers in resisting the uh, attempt to suppress the memoirs of Peter Wright, a member of the security services in the spy catcher litigation. And I was a junior member of the Observer team. And uh, I remember because he was very kind to me. Um, things have changed uh, in the legal profession a bit, but he was a very eminent lawyer then and took notice and took interest in me as, a, as, a, as someone starting out on their career, which was uh, very kind. And that's uh, very typical of him then and now. And it's also typical that what he was engaged in at that time was fighting restrictions on freedom of expression and arguing for publication of matters in the public interest. It was very different in the sense, of course, that this is the pre-internet age and the challenges are different. But Anthony has been involved in that fight uh, from then until now. Uh, if you, his, his biography in, in a paragraph uh, for the conference, of course, can't do justice to his, his career. As looking back, if you look at the, uh, as you can electronically on law reports, you can see that he features in the law reports from the late 1960s. Uh, fighting for employment rights for individuals and redundancy, fighting for immigration rights, fighting for civil liberties against the police, uh, fighting racial discrimination in particular. And what you can see in the case is that he's, in, he's there in the fight. He doesn't always win, but he carries on the fight. And he was at the forefront of the campaign against racial discrimination in England and uh, in the UK. Uh, and he was involved in, it, it, not just in the cases as a lawyer, but in, in the wider political movement and in drafting legislation. Right from the beginning, he realizes that there are more than one way to solve a problem. Uh, and his commitment to equality against discrimination, racial discrimination, sexual discrimination, sexual orientation discrimination, his commitment to fundamental principles, civil liberties as they used to be called, human rights as they are now. He's one of the main uh, reasons why we have a Human Rights Act and why the landscape changed in our domestic jurisdiction. Now, of course, this is a media law conference and Anthony has a long and uh, distinguished career in freedom of expression. And he, again, he engages on every level. He engages as a matter of principle, fundamental principle. He engages on the political level and he engages on a legal level. And it's that combination of the, of the law, the politics, and principle. He gets why, if you're talking about defamation. It's not just a question of lawyer's law. There's a constitutional dimension to it. It affects society. And, and we see it. His, he asks questions that don't get asked. You can track again through the cases, libel cases. Why can a trades union, a labor organization, sue for defamation? Why can a governmental body sue for defamation? Uh, why isn't there a public interest defense? And by spotting these issues, taking these issues, arguing these issues, Anthony has been at the forefront of legal changes in our domestic jurisdiction. And in part, he does that, and you can see through the cases, he is not afraid to use what's happening in other jurisdictions. He doesn't look at it from just an English common law perspective. He looks at Commonwealth cases. He looks at international cases. He looks at many different jurisdictions and pulls the best from those jurisdictions and uses them to advance legal change. In terms of our Defamation Act, I doubt very much that we'd have one if it hadn't been for Anthony. And I'm sure we'll be talking about that in the course of the conference in a number of different respects. Uh, for, on a personal note, 
it's, it's start, my involvement in, in, in that legal reform process started with a phone call from Anthony in December of 2009, almost four years ago, uh, just before the holidays. And uh, in a characteristic understatement, Anthony said he had a little project. Uh, he, he was thinking about uh, defamation reform, libel reform. Would I like to be involved? Of course I said yes, but little did I know what I was letting myself in for. Um, he drove that project on. He got a number of people involved, uh, practitioners, uh, pressure groups, people who work for newspapers, people from different perspectives. Uh, and he, he not only got people involved, but then having got them involved was determined to get the best out of them, to find what are the problems, what are the priority problems, what are the best ways of solving it, taking in different views and then driving the project on from, from idea, from discussion into action. And I was thinking about um, him as, as, as into three E's. He's engaging. He approaches people and you want to help. At a number of, of occasions over the four years before the Defamation Act went from bill to act, I was thinking, why am I doing this? Or why am I still doing this? And I'm sure others were having the same thoughts. And it was because Anthony had asked. He, he's, he, he's very engaging. Uh, and of course, this, this, this conference itself is, is, is something that's very much sparked by uh, Anthony. He's absolutely engaged himself in the project. Once he gets his teeth into a project, he does not drop it. And he's enormously energetic. When the defamation bill was going through, that was not the only important legal issue in our jurisdiction. There were many fronts in, in, in Parliament on which Anthony was engaged and playing a key role in making sure that the legislation being passed was not a horrible mistake. Uh, and his energy, you, see, you can see him in Parliament, you can see him in the courts, but I've had the privilege of being involved a, to a little bit behind the scenes with Anthony. Uh, and he is incredibly energetic. He's a remarkable lawyer, but my goodness, what a politician. Uh, in, in short, I, I think the word for Anthony is he's a phenomenon. Uh, and I was also just thinking, there's a, a small incident. We, I was in a, a lift in an elevator with Anthony in his chambers. We'd had a meeting about the defamation bill, and we were just coming down in the lift uh, with Sir Brian Neal, who's a, an eminent lawyer from uh, our jurisdiction. Uh, and they, we, we'd stopped talking about the bill, and we, Anthony was engaged in a debate about the merits of the latest technology, a debate about the latest iPhone versus the latest BlackBerry. And I was feeling very, very sort of behind the times, but it's absolutely typical of Anthony that he was up to the minute. He's interested, he's engaged, he moves with the times. So you have this combination of a man whose commitment to fundamental principles of equality, of justice, is as natural to him as breathing. And you have this enormous energy to get things done. And he not only moves with the times, he is helps to shape our times. And it's with enormous privilege that I introduce Anthony to give our opening keynote speech. Uh, thank you very much, Heather. Um, it, it's an enormous privilege to be back in Hong Kong. Uh, the introduction you just heard about me uh, was so ludicrously generous and detailed that it enables me to recall what happened when Dr. Henry Kissinger received the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, when an American lady came up to Dr. Kissinger and she said, and I won't try the accent because Rob Balian will tell me I get it wrong. Uh, the American lady said, uh, Dr. Kissinger, Dr. Kissinger, I, I wish to thank you for everything you've done to save the world. I wish to thank you on behalf of the whole of humankind. He replied, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, now, since everyone is saying nice things about everyone else, I, I wish to say some true things, not only about Heather, but the 
rest of my colleagues who've come uh, um, from London today because um, I, I, I would like to explain the privilege I feel in being with them. Uh, first of all, so far as Heather is concerned, uh, she is one of the few English libel lawyers who has been in favor of reform. The only body that was against the reform of the defamation law uh, was members of the libel bar, except for Heather and one or two other exceptions. Uh, and the reason why I seduced her into joining the team is because I had heard her views and realized that here was someone, a leading practitioner, who actually realized that the state of English libel law was in real need of change. So it's wonderful that Heather is here because I'm not really a proper libel lawyer at all, as she would be the first to agree. And she played a critical part in negotiating with civil servants throughout the three-year period in explaining to them, because they weren't experts either, the best way of securing a fair balance in our defamation law. Uh, then we have the master of the roles, Lord Dyson. He has responsibility, of course, uh, for overseeing the procedural changes that will be needed when the Defamation Act comes into force in April of next year. Uh, and it is particularly wonderful that he has uh, broken from an extremely busy time in London to arrive here in the, the, the nick of time. Uh, he is the master of the roles. And I'm reminded that uh, many years ago, uh, when Anglo-American uh, media conferences used to take place in an attempt to persuade the English judges to be more enlightened about free speech, many years ago, there was one held in Hythe uh, in Kent. Uh, and Lord Denning was there. And there were many senior British judges. But one of the judges explained how uh, he was the pajama judge who, in his pajamas at midnight, would uh, issue injunctions to restrain the press from publishing what they should not publish. Uh, and this greatly intrigued the American organizer, uh, Fred Friendly, who went and bought a pair of pajamas. <laughs> and that evening, uh, at the celebratory dinner, Fred Friendly uh, said uh, to the judge, who was a very sensitive and shy judge, he said to him, uh, I have bought these pajamas for you to recognize your role in issuing prior restraint injunctions in the middle of the night. And he had them in the box and he held them out. And the judge was so embarrassed that he was rooted to the spot and wouldn't get up to receive the gift. And Lord Denning got up and said, I am the master of the roles, but tonight I am the master of the pajamas. <laughs> and he got up, took the pajamas, and gave them to the judge, who never recovered from the embarrassment. <laughs> uh, and then Lord Hunt, uh, who is, uh, like me, a member of the House of Laws of Political. Uh, he, he and I had a great deal of fun some years ago in, in uh, opposing a measure of the Labour government that would have basically introduced a kind of blasphemy law into our system. But he now has the uh, impossible task of attempting to bridge the gap between the politicians uh, and the press uh, over what is called the Leveson uh, a report, which made me wonder what the title of my talk might be, Who Governs Lord Justice Leveson? But that's uh, perhaps another subject. So he is playing a crucial role, and self-regulation by the press will, I'm sure, uh, be a big issue. Now, I'm not going to read you a lecture. My wife tells me I'm even more boring when I read than otherwise, and, and you've, I, I've written a paper. I gave a lecture here which has been published already uh, last year, uh, and there's no need for me to bore you to tears with any detailed lecture. But what I'm going to do, if I may, is to set the scene a bit more widely 
than simply by looking at the detail of the defamation law, though I will briefly touch upon it. Hong Kong is an interesting place in, in which to hold a gathering of this kind. Uh, it, it's interesting because it's one of the few places in the world that has genuinely independent judges. Uh, I've had the privilege of uh, arguing here uh, since bycatcher in 1987. Uh, and I have noticed that your judiciary in Hong Kong is much stronger, much more independent, much more cosmopolitan, much better in every way that I can think of than it used to be before the resumption of sovereignty. Uh, and I've said as much to uh, the former foreign secretary who crafted that, uh, Jeffrey Howe. So it's a very remarkable place for that reason alone. If you think about how many countries of the world there are with really independent, clever, hardworking, cosmopolitan judges, there are damn few. It's also an interesting place because it is part of China. One country, two systems. And the common law system, uh, thanks to the judiciary, is flourishing here, and I hope and pray that at the end of the 50-year period, the People's Republic will realize the value of preserving this system uh, and seeing it develop further. And so far, I think, uh, the indications are very good. Uh, the third thing is that Hong Kong is one of those places whose constitution gives much more importance to courts than we do in our parliamentary democracy. You see, if you're thinking of a subject like defamation reform, and you're asking yourself, how could there ever be defamation reform in Hong Kong? Uh, the honest answer, I think, is that it would be unlikely to come as a result of any initiative by the political branches of government. As I read the situation, and as I read the basic law, uh, it is the, the courts, which unlike our courts, can strike down legislation which they find incompatible with the international government on civil and political rights and with the fundamental rights in the basic law. You give your judges more power than we give ours. Your judges, therefore, are in many ways the catalysts for change and in the lead. I hope I'm not going to offend the government or the legislators here when I say that I don't find the same likelihood of uh, law reform of this kind uh, from a legislative council that is plagued by the filibuster and party games of one kind or another and by an administration that would have no strong political incentive to change the law. So, so far as little Hong Kong is concerned, it's simply one example of how law reform is needed, but it may not happen in the same way that it happened in my country. And of course, uh, in the mainland of China, uh, reforms are much easier to accomplish, and there is a great deal more in the way of reforming legislation, some good and some not so good, what happens in mainland China. But I think it's of great importance that mainland China is represented here. And three years ago, when we were doing the Defamation Act, some leading uh, Chinese scholars came to see me in London, for example, about the internet, because they were very interested in, in what our defamation law was doing so far as, the, uh, as, so far as the internet is concerned, which again, if there's time, I'll briefly touch on. Now, why did, we, why did we begin this whole enterprise um, of, of reforming defamation law? Well, it really grew out of free speech organizations and uh, newspapers uh, and pressure also from the United States indirectly uh, to do something about the fact that the common law, which is the main part of libel law until now, the common law have been developed by judges ever since the ecclesiastical courts in the Middle Ages, 
ever since the Court of Star Chamber. It had been developed out of the Court of Star Chamber through the common law, but had hardly been looked at by Parliament at all. Uh, in the 20th century, there was a minor reform in 1952 and a procedural reform in 1996, but, but really nothing else. It had been left to the judges and the lawyers to, to uh, change the law on a case-by-case -case basis. The problem is that judges are not well geared to be lawmakers. If you're trying to uh, devise rules for the internet, you can hardly expect judges, uh, unelected judges, judges who decide cases on an individual case, case basis, you can't really expect them to come up with a whole series of necessary internet regulations. And because I had the good luck to argue some of the lead cases, as Heather has said, I came to the conclusion that piecemeal reform on a case-by-case -case basis was unlikely in my lifetime or my children's lifetime to produce a system which fairly balanced reputation, free speech, uh, um, one with the other, in a way that commanded public confidence. And so I used my privilege as a member of the House of Lords able to introduce uh, so-called private members' bills. And as Heather said, we spent a year, uh, um, a whole group of us, week after week, with Sir Brian Neal, a most distinguished uh, libel judge and from the Court of Appeal retired. We spent a whole year asking ourselves, what are the key changes that must be made to ensure that our libel law uh, is acceptable and strikes a fair balance? We thought the three political parties would be in favor of reform, and that turned out to be true. And so we identified a long list, and we shortened it. And I won't go through the history of everything, but uh, I just want to tell you some of the key changes that were made as a matter purely of headline. How many of you have ever had the good fortune to read the Hong Kong Defamation Ordinance? I asked the same question of the Law Society audience of 200 yesterday, and there was one who, uh, who, who, who replied. Now, to those of you who have the sad lives, I do, of reading that ordinance, that Victorian extraordinary uh, ordinance, and you, if you compare that ordinance, if you happen to be interested in the situation in Hong Kong, but you could do just the same in Canada or Australia or South Africa or New Zealand or anywhere else, although some of them have actually, as you've heard, uh, done some reform, but if you go through their law, and compare it with what we have done, you'll see that what we have done uh, is much more developed and much more progressive and much more, I dare say, uh, in need of being looked at by other countries, especially countries of the former British Empire, whose laws uh, they inherited from the British. And when the British have been reforming their laws, uh, um, need to think about whether the former colonies should do so as well. By the way, one of the things I haven't got time to go into, but there'll be a panel on it, is about speech crimes. Uh, I notice you still have plenty of speech crimes based on the common law in Hong Kong. Uh, we have abolished, by legislation, uh, we have abolished obscene libel, criminal libel, uh, blasphemous libel, and seditious libel. I know your basic law requires you to have a law on sedition, but it doesn't have to be as broad and vague as the old common law. We've also, I'm glad to say, except in Northern Ireland, uh, abolished the, the law which made it uh, a crime to be rude about judges. Uh, scandalizing the judiciary uh, is no longer a, a, a criminal offense, except in Northern Ireland. But I leave aside that necessary, that very necessary part of the story, which is getting rid of outdated criminal offenses, uh, and, and simply summarize now what the Defamation Act does. First of all, it creates a new hurdle 
before you can bring proceedings at all, you have to show serious harm. That is a way of trying to discourage trivial cases. Secondly, uh, companies can only bring a case if they can show serious financial loss, a hurdle which they will find difficult to surmount. Uh, there were those on the left of the subject who wanted to stop companies from being able to sue at all. I thought that was wrong because although companies have no feelings, they do have reputations that deserve protection and therefore to say they couldn't sue at all seemed to me not to be sensible and I didn't find the Australian way of dealing with it uh, either the best way for us. Thirdly, um, we've introduced a workable defense of public interest. The House of Lords um, uh, in the Reynolds case uh, went some way to creating such an, an, uh, uh, an offense, uh, sorry, such an interest. Um, but the trouble is that it didn't really help very much because it gave too many detailed factors to be taken into account and came to be used as a kind of checklist. After a great deal of debate, we decided to trust the judges without a checklist to uh, be able to weigh the public interest dealing, mark you, in a case where something defamatory and false has been published. It's not true. Um, th there's no defense of fair comment or honest opinion. There's no defense of privilege. And yet the newspaper says it is in the public interest, nevertheless, that it be published. Uh, and, and that is an, an important let out for the press, but it pays a price. The press have to show that it's in the public interest, that they have not been guilty of irresponsible journalism. And that seems to me to be uh, quite right. So there is the new wider defense of public interest leaving a very wide discretion uh, to the judges. We've relabeled the defenses of justification and uh, fair comment as truth and honest opinion. Heather in particular helped uh, to make the honest opinion defense something that really will work well. Uh, and uh, the burden of proof still rests upon the defendant uh, in establishing those defenses. Why didn't we adopt the American position? Why, why didn't we adopt what is known as the Sullivan Rule? That's a large question in itself, and I expect Rob Balin and I at some point might chat a bit about it, but if I can try to explain. The First Amendment says that Congress will pass no law abridging the freedom of speech. And it's up to the Federal Supreme Court of the United States to interpret that. And in the New York Times and Sullivan case, where Sullivan was a police chief, and the New York Times had published an advertisement by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored Peoples alleging police brutality in Alabama. Sullivan had sued for libel in Alabama, whose law was very similar to unreformed English law. And the Supreme Court said, because Sullivan was a public official, it was quite wrong that he could bring a libel action unless he could prove malice or reckless disregard for truth. And I more or less arrived at that conclusion with our House of Lords uh, in a case called Derbyshire County Council, uh, a case where the County Council tried to use libel law, and the House of Lords said, you can't. You're a public body. Uh, you have to use um, malicious falsehood, which is the same as Sullivan. You've got to prove bad faith or reckless disregard of truth. But then the American Supreme Court went well beyond that. They began to focus on what they called a public figure. If you were a public figure, regardless of the content of, of the publication, you could only bring a libel suit if you could prove uh, no bad faith, uh, I'm sorry, only if you could prove bad faith or reckless disregard of truth. So they said that a baseball coach uh, was a public figure. 
they said in New York that a stripper in a nightclub was a public figure. I mean, no joke. They said that uh, the trainer of, of, I think it was dolphins, was a public figure. And they, instead of asking themselves the right question, which is, does this publication deserve to be published in the public interest? They asked the question, who is the claimant? It's the wrong question, it seems to me. And uh, furthermore, transferring the burden of proof would never have got through the House of Commons or, or probably the House of Lords because it would have seemed to be uh, giving too much to the press and too little to the victim of defamation. Our desire throughout was to make sure that the law was reasonably balanced. That's to say, to make sure that reputation rights were protected as well as free speech rights. One of the problems has been about uh, legal aid and costs and, and poverty. The other two libel proceedings have been the sport of the rich and their lawyers. And their lawyers until recently used conditional fee agreements in a way that was oppressive also of free speech. But the ordinary person couldn't afford uh, the price of a high court libel trial, probably with a jury, probably with Queen's counsel on both sides. It became a law for the rich and not for the poor. And so one of the things we've been seeking to do is to downscale it, to make case management much more effective so that judges weed out bad cases early and get control of good cases in a way that is going to reduce costs. And as I say, uh, Lord Dyson uh, and, and his team are dealing with procedural reforms of that kind. We've also published, the government have also published uh, cost protection rules to give protection to the uh, impecunious claimant to make it easier for that kind of person to bring a libel claim than before. So this is not a charter for newspapers. Uh, although it helps newspapers, it does so with obligations as well, uh, and it seeks to protect uh, libel claimants uh, as well as uh, defendants. Now, so far as the internet is concerned, um, there is a new defense for uh, operators under Section 5, where the operator can show that he didn't publish on the website. The regulations have been published in draft. They've been sent for consultation. And they will be made, I think, at the same time uh, as the law itself comes into force. We have greatly extended what is called statutory qualified privilege to uh, peer review statements in scientific and academic journals uh, and beyond that. And we've got rid of the Duke of Brunswick. Uh, the Duke of Brunswick is a, a mid-Victorian case that decided that every time a defamatory statement is published, there's a fresh cause of action and time begins to run all over again. And that was hopeless with the internet because it meant that every time you clicked on uh, and read a defamatory statement, there was a fresh cause of action. And so a single publication rule with a one-year limitation period has been introduced. Libel tourism, that's to say, using the English courts for libel cases that belonged elsewhere, uh, there, there's a provision uh, discouraging that. Uh, and last week, without any need for this act at all, uh, in two judgments, our own courts have struck down uh, two attempts to use the English courts uh, uh, for libel cases which had no significant connection with our country. Uh, I've got a bit more time, perhaps. OK. Um, there are two horrible problems which have arisen, which I just need briefly to skate over. One is the Kel Celtic problem, especially the Northern Irish problem, but it applies to some extent in Scotland too. The problem is that the Defamation Act applies only in England and Wales. And because powers have been devolved to Northern Ireland and Scotland, uh, they can decide whether to adopt the Defamation Act there or not. 
And so far, uh, the uh, politicians in Northern Ireland have said no, they will leave the libel law just as it used to be, which causes immense pleasure to a particular libel lawyer who is advertising that Belfast should be the libel capital of the world. Uh, it's now gone to the Law Commission in Northern Ireland, and we very much hope that the Law Commission will say, yes, we need similar legislation in Northern Ireland, but if they said no, it would be a disaster because publishers can't decide to publish only uh, on the eastern side of the Irish Sea and not on the western side. In America, they have no such problem because the Americans have a federal system. And if the Supreme Court says in its majesty, this is now the rule in libel cases, then the state of Alabama it has no scope to uh, disagree. That is an, an advantage of federalism but we don't have federalism. The other appalling problem uh, is Leveson. Uh, not Lord Leveson, uh, Lord Justice Leveson, Sir Brian Leveson, a very fine uh, criminal judge. Uh, and uh, his inquiry was set up by the Prime Minister uh, in the wake of horrendous scandals about the press, about hacking about illegal activities of one kind or another. Uh, and he and a, and a team sat for uh, many months, uh, took evidence for many months, and produced uh, a report in, I think, 10 volumes uh, and over a 1,000 pages. And the part of the report which I thought was the most valuable, as you would expect of a highly skilled criminal judge, was the part which recorded the high crimes and misdemeanors of the newspapers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it didn't look at the high crimes and misdemeanors of others who use similar techniques, including law firms. Um, it looked only at newspapers because that was the particular context in which it was set up. So far, entirely so good. But then, he, he went much further, uh, and he made suggestions about a new regulatory framework uh, to govern the press. Uh, and while saying it should be self-governing and not state-regulated, he nevertheless floated some ideas which seemed to me to be wanting in compliance with basic principles. One was, that if newspapers didn't join a new uh, regulatory scheme, they could be fined with punitive or exemplary damages. The Strasbourg Court and our own High Court had already said that that would violate free speech, but it was put into the report. Another was he suggested that um, a state body Ofcom might well be the ultimate regulator of the print media. Again, that looked very much like state regulation of the print media, and I think was a, a, a mistake. Then the politicians came in. Now, you have to understand that the politicians in both houses, and David Hunt in particular, has had experience of this because of his treatment, if I may say so, in some of the debates where he has been subjected to extraordinary criticism and even abuse of someone who will stick up for a free press. The politicians don't like the newspapers. They especially don't like the newspapers because the Daily Telegraph exposed uh, fiddling expenses on a major uh, scale in both houses, leading to a reform of the system. And also many of them have been criticized for their political conduct. And so I sit in a chamber, as does David Hunt, where apart from those who are tied to the press already, there are very few of us who dare to suggest that the post-Leveson scheme uh, is a mistake. The defamation bill was taken hostage at a very late stage uh, by a cross-party group who wrote in an extraordinarily elaborate system of state regulation of the press. 
And the Prime Minister said, I'm not going to allow the defamation bill to become law unless those uh, uh, changes are removed. And I thought after three years' work, it was curtains, it was the end. What then happened was extraordinary. Parliament, in a rush, amended two uh, pieces of legislation. In one of them, they put the threat of exemplary damages uh, if the press didn't join the new scheme. In the other, they said, if there's to be a royal charter which governs the system, then the royal charter can only be changed by parliament. In other words, moving the charter into a subset of legislation. Uh, those two bits having got through, the Prime Minister agreed to let the Defamation Act become law, which it has. So on the one hand, we have a Defamation Act, which is a model, in my view, not only for the common law world, but beyond, in all the ways that it seeks to modernize the law. It's better, in my view, than anything anywhere. I say that even in the presence of Rob Balin from the land of the free. Uh, I think it's better than, than that. But on the other hand, we have a threat of press uh, regulation which has caused outcry across the uh, democratic world. And if it were to go through in anything like its current form, it would become a model for dictators everywhere who want to control the press. And so I would say we have a great deal to learn perhaps from the Defamation Act, but nothing to learn, nothing to learn from the post Leveson cock up, uh, which I think is going to continue because the politicians are now at war with the press. Uh, many of the newspapers are refusing to sign up, and nobody actually knows on the 30th of October a royal charter is going to be considered and perhaps approved. Uh, uh, if the press refuse, if they boycott it, which I think is probable, most of them, uh, if they boycott it, uh, then I dare say there'll be further legislation, and therefore the Defamation Act will turn out to have been a great reform poisoned by what's happened post Leveson. Uh, that's, that's about the state of things. Uh, so far as the little Hong Kong defamation ordinance is concerned, uh, well, it still has criminal defamation, ludicrous. Yeah, it still has trial by jury, questionable. Uh, it still talks about blasphemy and, and indecency, wrong. It doesn't do anything about the internet, wrong. It doesn't have a public interest defense, wrong. It doesn't have a serious harm test, wrong. Uh, and what will happen, I suspect, I hope, is that uh, Hong Kong lawyers will bring test litigation challenging bits of the defamation ordinance uh, against Article 27 of the Basic Law so that the judges will be the catalyst for reform. Uh, and that has normally been the case in any event. Thank you for listening to me. Esther, it's really an honor to hear your speech today, and I'm from mainland China, and as we know that there are a lot of aspects in mainland China law system that can be um, reformed to make it a better society, and in your opinion, what are some lessons and experiences that we can draw from other countries' um, law system, and what are the, um, like the distinction, um, and what are some unique aspects about China that you think can be reformed? Thank you. Can I speak? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, as you know, uh, the United States has no liability for internet service providers. They have absolute immunity, all but. That's one end of the, sp of the spectrum. The other end is the situation in mainland China, where there is very excessive regulation of the internet uh, by a man, the great, I think it's called the, the Chinese intranet and the great firewall of China. Uh, and there is massive regulation, which doesn't always work very well, 
because people of your age know perfectly well how to uh, uh, get alternative accounts that can give you access through the internet to information from across the world. Uh, the Chinese um, code, I forget the name of it, the code which allows for um, privacy laws to be introduced, when I last looked at it, uh, hadn't been implemented with any detailed regulations. Um, I, I am not an expert, of course, on matters Chinese in that sense at all. My hope is that China is so self-confident and so strong that it will find it possible to move towards a more liberal regime so far as the censorship of the internet and the press generally is concerned. I'm bound to say that two years ago, I was giving a talk uh, in, I, I will mispronounce it, Suzhou, Suzhou University Law School, about this subject. Half the class spoke Mandarin uh, as well, and English, uh, the other half only Mandarin. Uh, at the end of my talk, uh, the questions I received from the students were as sharp and open and critical of their own system as, as anything I would hear in London. And I did my best to explain my admiration of that. And at the very end, a woman put up her hand and said, Lord Lester, what makes you think we will not suffer the fate of Singapore? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, Lord Lester, in Singapore, they have economic prosperity, but no sense of freedom. And I said, the fact that you've just asked the question, and the fact that you asked the question in front of your entire faculty, and you couldn't have asked that question 10 years ago without being locked up, tells me that this is not Singapore. Uh, and I am actually optimistic, without being naive, about the capacity of young people uh, and the intelligence of those in Beijing to be able to maintain a unified state, but at the same time develop more political freedom and freedom of the press. Got lots of thoughts. I'm sure we'll be following up over the next uh, two days from that question. Just a brief question on uh, Tom Kellogg, Open Society Foundation is also from the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you for uh, your excellent uh, remarks, Lord Lester. Uh, uh, my question is about here in Hong Kong, and uh, I was very interested in your suggestion that uh, things could start with test litigation. Uh, but my guess would be, without having researched it, that uh, cases are few and far between. How many blasphemy cases do we really have? in any given year. So in the absence of those cases, in the absence of those prosecutions, uh, what to do? Uh, that, that's a perfectly uh, true. Um, I mean, we were only able to get rid of blasphemy um, through, through legislation. Um, and the difference is that we are a full parliamentary democracy with centuries of tradition in calling the government to account. Uh, and unlike, uh, unlike the land of the free, um, when the government decides it wants to legislate, it legislates. As you know, in your system, when the government wants to legislate, the last thing it can do is to legislate. Um, because uh, Mr. Madison's checks and balances have produced institutional paralysis. Uh, in, in Hong Kong, I think it is true, and I hope I will not be deported for saying this. Um, in Hong Kong, I think it's true that it's a fairly sleepy system so far as legislative reform is concerned. That is true. Um, but it only would take one vigorous individual within the system, uh, I think, to change that. Um, even with incomplete democracy, that's true. So far as case law is concerned, there have been, um, I mean, I've been very lucky. I've done about five cases here. Uh, and 
I am very impressed by the capacity of the judges to um, decide issues of principle, but not overreach themselves. Uh, they, they don't use their strike down powers unwisely. They do state principles, and they're very careful to respect the separation of powers. I wish that the other two powers, the political ones, were as conscious of their functions uh, as, the, as the judges are. Uh, and really, instead of squabbling uh, among those political parties, if only one could get uh, them together uh, to, to um, work towards law reform as we do. I mean, I sit on a parliamentary committee in the House of Law, the Joint Committee of both houses. There are 12 of us, six peers, six House of Commons. We are not tribal. We work across parties, and we work for law reform. Uh, and that is because we've now developed that sort of a common spirit. Uh, there's no reason why that couldn't happen in Hong Kong. Lord Lester, if I may interject here, if you could come here, spend some time, and accomplish getting all the sites together, hail to the king. <laughs> yes, but I, I'm not divine. I know. <laughs> But he is a lord, that's true. Um, if, I, <laughs> if I could just uh, very briefly um, uh, answer uh, one of your observations, it is true that there aren't that many cases, very few cases, on uh, the criminal aspects of defamation law. And it is true that the defamation ordinance is a sad, sorry um, example of, of an ordinance. But it's not meant to be the main uh, impetus for uh, development of defamation law, which remains the common law. And what is really needed is the test cases, but on the civil side. Um, as you know, having been a litigator here, uh, it's very expensive to litigate cases. And I uh, would imagine, and I think most of the lawyers, uh, Hong Kong lawyers here would agree, that it's very expensive to amount uh, defense. It would cost upwards of 10 million Hong Kong dollars to get up to the Court of Final Appeals. We've had had such a case, but it required an individual with deep pockets. And that's not usually the case with media companies. Uh, so if there are lawyers who are willing in this audience to be, do pro bono work and come here and contribute uh, some time and energy and uh, free services, that might go a long way toward helping in Hong Kong. Well, we, we, we deal with that. And obviously, litigation is very expensive everywhere. But many, many members of my chambers um, uh, do public law cases, um, either for no fee um, or uh, a, a conditional fee. Or we have developed something called protective cause orders, which is that we go to the court at an early stage uh, in a public interest case, uh, and we say we won't be able to have this public interest case litigated unless the court orders that we won't have to pay the other side's costs if we lose. Uh, and that has been a developing uh, jurisprudence. Lord Dyson would know it much better than me, but that has been a developing jurisprudence. And out of the 95 members of my chambers, or thereabouts, I would say half of them spend quite a lot of their time doing public interest litigation. And they do so because it's fun, and it's important, and it's good publicity for them. And so we are in the position where people want to do that kind of thing. Johanna, is that likely to happen here in Hong Kong? <laughs> Um, I, I'm just thinking of a slightly different question when you mentioned about the abolitions of um, scandalizing the court. Uh, I agree that the law should be reformed there. Uh, there are a lot of things that we can tighten up, but uh, should we go all the way to abolish it? Uh, I, I should plead guilty that I, I prosecute for the last scandalizing the court case in Hong Kong, uh, and which in, involved uh, the largest circulation, the newspaper with the largest circulation sent a team of reporters following a call of appeal judge for three days round the clock in retaliation of a judgment given against them. 
Uh, that would be the sort of situation should, should, should the lobby reform completely abolish, uh, given particularly the political situation in Hong Kong, as you point out, there are less confidence in the other two branches of the government. The judiciary is high, uh, held in high esteem and respect. So all the more, that means the judiciary could be even more fragile when the judiciary is being attacked. So would that political circumstances justify some kind of reform uh, scandalizing the court? Well, we're, we're going to have a panel on this uh, tomorrow. Uh, um, but, but perhaps I could just say a sentence or two, because I've been a bit involved in that. Um, of course, it arose in Northern Ireland, uh, like many things. Uh, it arose because Peter Hain, a, a well-known Labour politician, published his memoir, and in the course of it criticized a judge for his conduct. Uh, and the judge was, I think, quite a sensitive person uh, and was very upset. Uh, and the Attorney General in Northern Ireland then moved uh, to um, uh, commit Peter Hain to prison uh, for contempt of court. Uh, I advised the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. We put in uh, our arguments uh, against that, and the Attorney General decided to withdraw immediately and not pursue it further. Um, there are strange English cases which talk, as you do, about small countries, uh, small colonies, small islands, which are different from a big country, where you have to insulate the judges from unfair criticism. Uh, and that is the sort of basis which was used in Singapore to put Alan Shadrake into prison when he criticized the Singapore judiciary over the death penalty. All those cases were cited. Um, we, we introduced an amendment to abolish it altogether. And we consulted the Law Commission, who have a wider consultation at the moment, precisely about whether one should put something in its place or not. Uh, the, the, it had twice reported on that. And they came to the conclusion, and I came to the conclusion, that, that we didn't need to put anything in place. And the judges themselves seemed also to think that they didn't need this peculiar protection for judges alone. And so we haven't put anything in place. Uh, and so far, people have been no more rude to judges than they used to be. I well remember, I mean, you get some vile, appalling things done to judges, and that's why we pay them so badly, to have to put up with it. Um, I remember when we did Spycatcher, one of the worst was when, I think it was the Daily Mirror, published pictures of all five law lords with a headline, You Fools. I think that um, it, we, we, we oh, I, I see a hand raised. Doreen, are we allowed or? It's uh, John Bacon Okay, one, one, oh, planted questions. <laughs> I just have one follow up exactly along those lines because one critical difference between Hong Kong and the UK is we have no law on stalking. And that comes back to the earlier discussion because in the proposal from the Law Reform Commission on stalking, we proposed a public interest defense. And the media refused to accept that a public defense was good enough. So it seems to me you're arguing defamation of public interest defense is good enough. So I'd be interested to hear your views on that. Well, I don't think the press can have it both ways. If they want to have the privilege of being treated as a profession and to get a defense for committing what would otherwise be a tort, which would be very harmful to the victim, They've got to earn it, uh, and that's the price they pay. Otherwise, they can have the old law. Uh, we, and remember, it's the old law which President Obama has refused to apply to the United States at all. I mean, just this, I just want to mention this because you probably don't know this. In Britain, we stopped Singapore and Malaysia bringing their libel law to London. We passed a special measure when we were harmonizing tort law to stop them bringing their appalling laws to England. But Obama then did the same to us in something called the Speech Act, 
under our old law, you can no longer enforce an English common law libel judgment in the United States. A bit rude, but then uh, that, that's what they have done. And, and I don't know whether now, under our reformed law, um, our American masters will take a different view. <laughs> I think that's a very appropriate note on which to end. Um, I'm sure there are many, many points arising from that that we'll be discussing over the next two days. And uh, I think this should always leave the audience wanting more. And I'm sure, so for my part, sitting here, I, I certainly want more, and I hope that you do too. Uh, Lord Lester, thank you very, very much for opening the conference. <laughs> <laughs>